Um, and in fact, with that topic in mind, there are studies showing in humans that low carb approaches like ketogenic diets actually improve binge eating and reduce um, food cravings and addictive uh, food behavior. So for people with high self-control and no signs of addictive eating, like guys that are extremely lean and used to, frankly, a, a high degree of, I, I say self-abuse, but I don't mean that in an ugly way. I mean, these are people who are used to really punishing their bodies through workouts, et cetera, high, high self-control, high self-discipline, that this very high simple sugar diet might be more feasible because they can manage the potential hunger spikes or the potential cravings just through just gritting their teeth and having discipline. But in these cases, in these cases, I think the reporting of the short-term benefits, like the energy boosts, et cetera, I think it can work in them and it doesn't lead to overconsumption or addictive eating behaviors. But for those with lower self-control or addictive patterns, and let's face it, that kind of describes most people who are overweight with or without type two diabetes, which is a disease of poorly metabolizing glucose, but these rapid glucose spikes and then the drops could absolutely trigger cycles of binging, which could undermine any of these improvements. But I just note all of this to just underscore the importance of personalizing diets based on who you are and, and how you are and how you behave. Now, one other point on this is some gender considerations, because while it is easy to find lean, highly physically active, very muscled men that advocate the sugar diet, it's actually harder, just as a fun bit of homework, it's harder to find women who report the same things. So when it comes to the sex considerations, women might not be responding as well to this and may be more sensitive to these to the glycemic and insulinemic variability of the high sugar diet. Um, now, all of this is, of course, based on anecdotes. There aren't studies to show this. Um, and the, the really well thorough studies that look at the sugar diet as it is currently used. But I, I'm, I mentioned protein restriction generally in a study. We're going to come back to some mechanisms in a moment. So there's a little more evidence than perhaps I'm suggesting. But, but if you try to find comparable anecdotal evidence that you see in men and find it in women, it is harder. I'm not saying there aren't some out there, maybe, but I, I couldn't find any just as an interesting survey of social media. And that is where much of the sugar, if not well, all of the sugar diet exists. It doesn't exist in the published literature as it is currently practiced. Um, and with all of that in mind, one important aspect to consider is satiety, this feeling of fullness that will drive our hunger and eating. Research on high-carb diets, particularly those emphasizing simple sugars, like in the sugar diet, show mixed but usually concerning effects on satiety. Some studies indicate that high-carb meals can lead to a quicker return of hunger compared to meals higher in protein or fat. For example, one of the studies that I have in my citation list is a 2014 study that had participants consuming a high-carb, low-fat breakfast, and they reported a significantly faster and stronger return to hunger. Um, uh, so these are people who they'd eat the meal, same amount of calories, and be much hungrier sooner than a meal that was lower in carbs and higher in fat, but it was equal in protein. So that's, that's a bit something where maybe a sugar diet adherent would say, well, they should have done a low protein version to see how they feel. Um, that, and that's, that's a valid point because it does seem like some of the benefit uh, and that's including that study in people with metabolic syndrome that I noted, I think it was a 2016 study, uh, their fat levels were pretty modest. It was about like a 30% fat diet, and then it was 60% carb or 70% or so, and then it was extremely little protein. Um, so there is some theme here that protein uh, restriction appears to be good in the high sugar diet, and yet – what we know from so much human evidence is that protein has a very strong satiating effect, more satiating than carbohydrates, more satiating than fat. And so you'd think that high protein diets are going to suppress appetite more effectively and support weight loss. And indeed they do. 
Um, and that the more you are cutting protein, the more you are, especially focusing on carbs, the more you are going to have hunger and blood sugar fluctuations that could lead to overeating. Now, of course, fiber is an underlying confounding variable here in that the sugar diet is surprisingly devoid of fiber. So this is another reason where the sugar diet would be offensive to many plant-based people because they, of course, are such advocates of protein consumption. So one way of looking at the sugar diet is it basically is just a big middle finger to every other diet. All right. Now, having said all of this, I have made it clear and I will make it even clearer now by saying that I think a lot of what we're seeing is surprisingly a restriction in protein. Um, this is surprising, and it's it's even a little awkward for me because I'm an advocate of eating protein, and yet I think that is actually the most likely mechanism because of not only that 20, uh, I think it was a 2022 study actually that I had mentioned a moment ago where they had them eat low protein and just cutting back protein, even in the absence of any calorie cutting, they, they performed as well as the calorie cutting group. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through mechanisms, because I actually attribute much of the molecular mechanism to the restriction in protein and what that elicits. Okay, with that in mind, I think a very relevant molecular mechanism that underlies a lot of this apparent metabolic benefit to the sugar diet could be a protein called fibroblast growth factor 21, FGF21. It's a hormone that is produced in the liver, and it increases with protein restriction. Now, one of the studies I'm going to cite in a moment, I need to acknowledge Nick Norwitz, a friend and really sharp science mind. Uh, he, I wouldn't. I don't know that I would have found this very recently published study if it hadn't been for him highlighting it. So I, I'm happy to acknowledge him being the source of me being able to share this with you. Okay, now before I get to that 2025 study, um, studies in mice and humans have shown that FGF21 increases during low protein feeding. Um, and now that is metabolically favorable when FGF21 goes up because FGF21 improves insulin sensitivity. It promotes fatty acid oxidation. It enhances mitochondrial biogenesis. All of these things that are going to be favorable. A 2022 study in mice showed that FGF21 is also essential for lifespan extension, so promoting longevity and some metabolic pr improvements that you do see with protein restriction. In humans... Um, low protein diets also elevate FGF21, potentially mimicking some of these benefits from fasting without calorie restriction. Now, here's the study that I alluded to a moment ago, a, a very relevant paper published in 2025. So very recently, coincidentally, coinciding with the rise of the sugar diet. And it was published in a very good journal, Nature Metabolism. I'd love to publish in that journal. It's great. But it provides some pretty compelling evidence for these effects that I'm talking about. This is a randomized trial and it involved, here's a wrinkle, it was only healthy lean men. Now, ladies, lest you be upset, most weight loss trials actually do include women. Women are, if anything, overrepresented. So don't, please don't think that it's some cabal against the fairer sex. Um, but here it is, uh, healthy lean men were the study population which again comes back to the bias that I believe is inherently getting included in all of this just through the social media influencers that are promoting it. All right. They were young, healthy, lean men. Now, the trial lasted for five weeks, which is a pretty good length of time for a study. And the participants followed a low-protein diet where they could only get 9% of their calories from protein. And interestingly, when they went on the low protein diet, they needed to consume about 20% more calories, almost 600 calories a day, just to maintain their body weight. Let me say that again. They had them shift over to a very low protein diet, 9% of calories from, pro from protein. And in so doing, in order to maintain their body weight, they needed to eat 20% more calories. That's pretty crazy. Now, even in the midst of this, so they lost about one kilogram of fat and they didn't lose any muscle. 
Now, a confounder there is, though, that they could have had – they didn't measure muscle, but they just measured fat-free mass with water. So maybe there was some water retention. Maybe there was a little bit of muscle loss. But based on this good study, it seemed like they didn't. Now, let's come back to the mechanism. FGF21 levels surged dramatically to a level that you don't often see in humans with any sort of thing. But FGF21 levels went up by – over uh, by over 360 percent so like a f it almost went up by like four times and um, at, at a peak compared to the normal protein group and no surprise this correlated with a lot of changes in mitochondrial function but even in the fat cells now this is something that my lab has focused on before you've heard me discuss this phenomenon of mitochondrial uncoupling where my lab has found that when ketones are up the mitochondria in the fat cells are burning more energy, but wasting it as heat. So it's not it's not coupled to burning more energy from glucose or fats in order to create more ATP, the functioning kind of energy unit for the cell. No. So normally you'd say, well, a cell needs this much energy, and so it's going to burn the fuel to get that much energy. But not when the mitochondria are uncoupled, and that's what they found in this study, that they noted that there was a significant increase in this metabolic inefficiency, which sounds like a bad thing, but in this case, it's a good thing uh, because it's the uncoupling. The mitochondria are inefficient, so they're burning fuel not because the cell needs energy, but it's just wasting it as heat, and that would absolutely explain some of the phenomenon that they found, which is – or some of the phenomena they found, namely – one being an increased metabolic rate or the need to eat more food in order to just maintain body weight. Now, interestingly, these benefits were independent of whether the non-protein calories came from carbs or fats. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty inconvenient um, for those of us who feel like we've got a pretty great grasp of of what makes fat cells get big and what makes them small. Everyone would focus on either fats or carbs. They would say it's just the calories or it's the insulin effect. And this study is, one, like I said, kind of like a big middle finger, pardon please the crass metaphor here, to, uh, to both camps because it's saying, well, you're all wrong. It's actually just cut protein. You cut protein, FGF21 levels go through the roof and – and, and then you are going to be burning energy like gangbusters because of so much mitochondrial uncoupling. Um, so the study highlights very clearly protein restriction is a key driver of metabolic benefits. And it's very likely why the sugar diet experiences such remarkable is, – is reported to find such incredible results. Now, that study that I just shared with you differs from the sugar diet because it also allows a lot it allowed a lot of fat. So I need to be clear. That study that I just cited reporting the big improvement in FGF21 